Welcome to this session of Patients Today, where we will discuss a number of abstracts in the early and late stage lung cancer space, which were presented earlier this year at ESMO in Madrid. My name is Anne-Marie Baird, I'm President of Lung Cancer Europe, and it's my pleasure to be here today with Professor Solange Peters, who is past president of ESMO and a medical oncologist at CHUV Lausanne University in Switzerland. Today, we're going to have this in two sections, talking about the early stage space and then the late stage space. And we are now discussing the late stage space in this part um, of our activity. So I'll pass over to Professor Peters to start the presentation of the abstract data. Thanks so much, Anne-Marie. I'll start with the official disclaimer for the activity of today and my disclosures. And then I will move to the abstract. We have four abstracts. It was a difficult selection process, but we have decided for four abstracts, which really give rise to some new concepts, context for the patients and for the caregivers. But of course, this has some subjectivity in the, in the decision and the choices. Uh, keep in mind before starting that now we subdivide our lung cancer patients into two categories. The one which are the usual lung cancers, the old days lung cancers when I was trained, which is a smoking related lung cancer. Uh, it can also be the pollution related lung cancer now based on the new data from Charlie Swanton, meaning some damage done to the lung repetitively, which gives rise to many, many mutations and a cancer. Uh, this still is a majority of lung cancer. Very often it can be squamous, non-squamous, even small cell, that the majority of lung cancer. But we have another group of patients that the category B, which is very often observed in younger patients, never smoker patients, which is called oncogene addiction. And it's not a series of mutations which generate cancer, but a single one which creates a whole malignant phenotype. It's called the oncogene. It's also called a driver. The tumor is called oncogene addicted. And we have been identifying many of these drivers, a dozen of them in lung cancer, so that we aim and hope to find uh, as, at baseline as soon as we have a diagnosis of lung cancer and particularly advanced non small cell lung cancer to avoid chemo and maybe to have the chance to give a targeted therapy a treatment which is supposed to block the specific mutation, the specific signaling through the mutation in order to be able to spare chemotherapy or even to delay chemotherapy for the next line. So the first abstract is about oncogene addiction, you have understood. And one of these alterations found in, let's say, one person of non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, but it's even probably, yes, less than one person. It's only in non-squamous adenocarcinoma, probably even less than one person. It's a rearrangement of the chromosome, which is a red fusion protein, which gives rise to a signaling in the cell, dictating immortality, invasiveness, metastatization, and so on. So a very strong driver, okay? This red fusion, this is the pie we have now. It's nice to see it, right? This is the pie. The outer circle is the mutations you find in the, in the Asian population. The inner circle in the Western population, you can spend some time on it. And you can see the red, driver, they, they, take, they take it at 1.7, it can even be lower, but a very small kind of um, a slice of this pie, of this, this pie. They were, for all of these drivers, there are drugs being developed. And for DIRET, there were many, but at least two very good drugs now, which can be used based on conditional approvals, right, in late lines of treatment, uh, in many countries, selbercatinib and pralcetinib, two drugs. Very often, as I, we said before, uh, some kind of disparity in accessibility, but very often it can be given. But unfortunately, very often also in late lines after chemo, and that's not exactly what we want. So very promising activity of these compounds, but uh, very strong activity, right? We show response rate of around 70% with this drug, right? But But the regulator was not happy. The regulator was telling, even if chemo has a response rate of 30%, uh, your drug has a response rate of 70%, even if you double the progression-free survival, we are not convinced that it's better than chemo. So they asked the company to do a randomized trial. We can discuss it later on. This is, for me, slightly unethical. However, it was done, and all my respect. 261 patients, which means thousands of patients screened, right? 261 patients with metastatic disease and red fusion positive, randomized to chemo or selpercatinib. 
For purpose, the pharma industry has allowed to give even chemo IO. We think IO doesn't work in this never smoker patient, but still they want it to optimize. If you want to give IO, you can give IO. So chemo plus minus IO versus cell percatinib. So primary endpoint was progression-free survival. And what we were all convinced of, it, it would be positive. PFS would be way better with cell percatinib. Maybe the good thing is they follow the FDA advice allowing for crossing over. So for this patient who progress on the chemo, at least they can cross over, they can receive cell percatinib afterwards, which at least is a relief for the physician. It, it protects a little bit the, uh, the ethical considerations here, right? But basically, we were convinced it would be positive. So basically, it was super positive. Cell percatinib demonstrated superior PFS with a hazard ratio of 0 0.46, meaning that you reduce the risk of progression 54%, right? So absolutely amazing. With or without immunotherapy, uh, with the chemo, it doesn't change anything. We, we did suspect it, right? So the median PFS for the uh, cell percatinib was 25 months. It was 11 months for the chemotherapy. And what is again very interesting is all this oncogene addiction disease do a lot of brain metastasis. They do relapse in the brain. Chemo doesn't go to the brain. So when you give cell percatinib versus chemo, you will massively impact the risk of brain relapse or brain disease. With here, a time to progression in the brain, which had a hazard ratio of 0 0.26, meaning that you prolong the time without brain relapse of 74% by giving 84, no, 74, sorry, by giving the cell percatinib. So very important data. This is the curves, right? This is the, on the left, the patient receiving chemo IO, on the right, receiving only chemo, absolutely same thing, right? It's way better than chemo, but you, we knew it before the trial was done. Selvercatinib also offers a better response rate, 11% for chemo, more than double with selvercatinib. Um, uh, sorry, uh, I'll do it uh, better. Duration of response, double with uh, selpercatinib, 11.5 months for control, 24 months for the for selpercatinib. Response rate is also improved 20%, 65% for control, 84% for selpercatinib. So way better response rate and duration of response. Sorry for the wording. Uh, intracranial, look at the intracranial response rate. It's way improved, 58% for control, 82% for selpercatinib. So basically, Everything improved with selpercatinib, but as I said before, we knew it before. This is what we call a cumulative incidence rate, a cumulative risk assessment, when you have the risk of developing brain metastasis in blue the selpercatinib and in gray the control arm. So really, over time, you reduce the risk of developing a, a relapse at the brain level. Selpercatinib has some toxicity. You have to keep it in mind. It is one of this uh, targeted therapy, tyrosine kinase inhibitor, TKI, which has some hypertension, some GI toxicity with mainly diarrhea, some perturbation of the liver test, and can give rise to some rash and some fatigue. So keep in mind, really, that it's not without side effect, but chemo also has side effect. And keep in mind also that the duration of exposure to selpercatinib is way longer than the one of chemo. So these curves can be more or less compared because you don't expose the patient to the same duration. But anyway, this is uh, always low-grade toxicity. We know quite well how to manage these toxicities, but this is not without toxicity. GI, hypertension, liver test, and some rash and fatigue. So let's keep it in mind. This can be something to follow up quite, uh, I would say, carefully. So selpercatinib significantly improved progression-free survival. This is the first randomized study to demonstrate that uh, in red fusion, selpercatinib or a targeted therapy is better than, than chemo. It's possible that we will never show a benefit in overall survival. I hope we will not, because if you allow for crossing over, you might make the difference in survival becoming very small. So meaning that if you really have a good crossing over and you catch up every patient that relapsed, you should have a small difference in overall survival, maybe one, but very small. But we'll see later down the road. I don't need a benefit in overall survival. Remember in lung cancer, the best treatment first is the rule because some patients never get, some patients never get to the second line treatment. So what is a bottleneck? Bottleneck is testing. 
Finding a red fusion needs an, a test which is difficult. You need to look at the RNA, so the expression of the gene, which needs a very refined test, which is not available elsewhere. So first of all, already large-scale testing is not available elsewhere, but this specific test for red, even less. So the main problem is not only accessibility to treatment, but accessibility to testing. And it might be we miss half or three out of four of these positive uh, cases at the time being in Europe. Anne-Marie? Yeah, so thank you so much, Solange. I mean, I think you just hit the nail on the head there in terms of the access to the testing and access to comprehensive genomic testing, because for a lot of people, they may have access, but it may only be to the more kind of common oncogene drivers rather than kind of that comprehensive panel. So I'm sure there's quite a lot of people that are being missed out in terms of these sort of rare um, molecular drivers. Um, I guess really my question around this data, because it is very clear, you've said that a lot of this was known previously. So I'm just wondering, do you think there's a little bit of sort of a, a disconnect sometimes on what goes to trial versus what we know already? Because given, you know, obviously people impacted by this disease, when they sign up to participate in a clinical trial, they're doing it because, you know, they are very altruistic and want to help other people with the disease. So do you feel we need to maybe be more collaborative in nature as well with, with clinical trial design and setting and prioritization? Well, I think sometimes you need to randomize because you find that two strategies are not so much different. And of course, remember, you compare something extremely expensive, fancy, difficult to access to, to the old days chemo. So when something is not obviously different, of course, you need to compare because then even the patient-related outcomes might make the difference. But when you speak about something which is massively different, so really, undoubtedly, way better looking at all the parameters, including the way of administration. This is oral, uh, chemotherapy is IV. So when you have absolutely no doubt about the difference, then you, we should start to argue against these clinical trials. Why? Not because we don't want to establish, but because we have enough databases all around the world to create high quality synthetic arms, meaning that I can find way enough patients having been treated with chemo, having a retro arrangement in the databases in Switzerland to tell you what is the PFS and the OS of these patients. And if I want to go beyond Switzerland because you want a more diverse population, you can take 20 pa patients for each of the country around, but you don't need to randomize. You can have a ballpark and even a nice ballpark uh, a group of patients to tell you the truth without having to expose patients to a less efficient strategy. So we need to convince, maybe based on that trial, the authorities that the day of uh, using real world data, as we call real world evidence, has come. And we should not randomize these patients to, to these trials. Even, you know, even if you allow crossover, having cancer is about having accidents, right? When you receive chemo, you can do a pulmonary embolism, you can do a bleeding, you can do an infection. There is a mortality to chemo. So some of these patients will die from the disease or from the chemo before having seen the drug which can maintain them in life for years. So this is not to be, this is not defendable anymore. So really a very clear point that we all need to work together to ensure that those databases, all of that information that's pre-existing and out there that are used and integrated into trials and nearly kind of like an AI <laughs> sort of feeling, if you would, um, because as you say, we need to ensure that, you know, we're not reinventing the wheel and that when these trials are designed, if we can use something like a synthetic arm, that that is then what is being done. So thank you so much for that, Solange. So we'll move on to our next abstract in the late stage space. So the next abstract is uh, the other way around. Here we go back to all comers, right? Uh, meaning unselected patients. Really here you take all the patients. And why do you take all the patients? Is because we meet here an other unmet need. Uh, the unmet need is what to do in second line, meaning that now we have chemo IO, immunotherapy, wonderful strategies when you are, have metastatic uh, disease in front line. So the first line has to be immunotherapy. It can be immunotherapy, therapy chemo, immunotherapy only, immunotherapy, double immunotherapy chemo, but you have immunotherapy. But what to do next? 
You have given your platinum, you've given your immuno. So we have been trying a hundred different strategies, right? We have been randomizing at least in five negative trials. So the control arm and the standard of care is still docetaxel. So when you have a second line strategy to define in lung cancer, it's still docetaxel. Docetaxel is given every three weeks at a high dose of 75 milligrams per square meter. It is super toxic. You lose the hair, you lose the appetite, you lose the willingness of doing things, it gives rise to an extreme fatigue. Really, it's, it's a drug we always try to avoid to use. I would even say docetaxel Z dose is only given in clinical trials because we all malax it in a way which prevents us to give it. So we give it weekly, we change a bit the regime. We It's a terrible, but it's still the standard of care. So everything we could do better should be tested. That's why we have five negative trials but we still try. So now we have this new generation of ADC. ADC is antibody drug conjugate. You probably know them. It's an antibody which targets a protein which is obviously only expressed on cancer cell or mainly expressed on cancer cell. So the antibody binds to this protein on the surface of the cancer cell. And this antibody is carrying on the back a very toxic chemo. We call it payload, a super toxic chemo, a chemo that you could not give in the vein, right? IV, because it's too toxic. So the idea is to bring the poison to the cancer cell and it's a very strong poison. So one of this uh, uh, anchor, one of this target protein is called TROP2. It's highly found in metastatic lung cancer, but also in breast, for example. And you have a very strong payload, tox toxic compound, which is a deruxtecan, which is a very toxic chemo. Okay, uh, and it's a to all patients with or without oncogene addiction, by the way, in second line versus docetaxel. So you understand 604 patients, relapsed uh, disease, uh, or this, we call it dato, datopotamab deruxtecan. This is the antibody drug conjugate versus docetaxel. Primary endpoint, progression-free survival, end of overall survival. Keep in mind that we want to get rid of docetaxel. So that's our aim in life as oncologists, right? So at the ESMO meeting, we could see a benefit in progression-free survival. So benefit in progression-free survival gave rise to a hazard ratio of 0 0.75, meaning reducing the risk of progression against docetaxel 25%. So already something which makes us very happy because uh, it's a long time we are waiting for that. Interestingly, the benefit was only seen in patients with non-squamous, non-small cell lung cancer. Remember today, non-squamous is probably 75%, three out of four hour patients, right? Um, but only seen in non-squamous. And here the hazard ratio is even better, 0 0.63. So here really it makes sense to give it, but because it's better than docetaxel. Keep just something in mind. Huh? Look at this PFS. It's not 19 months like we were discussing before. Huh? It's four months for DATO DXD and three months for docetaxel. So anyway, we speak about short times, right? Short times. It's important to keep it in mind. But basically, it's way better in non squamous with DATO, DATO DXD, right? The response rate, which is also important for the patient, is doubled with the datopotamab deruxtecan taken from 13% to 26. So something significant because sometimes response is about a relief of symptoms, right? And the duration of response was also prolonged, right? So you will ask me, what's the price, the price to pay? So uh, the price is already so high for those attack cells that it's difficult to compete with that. So we are all convinced that the price exists. But I think the price is still a little cheaper. So there is toxicity for datopotamab deruxtecan. So most important toxicity is some fatigue, some nausea. But the most important thing I've been seeing is stomatitis. So in terms of, you know, fatigue and nausea, it's a bit like chemo. Remember, this is a chemo, by the way, locally uh, delivered. But stomatitis is very specific. It's not only an inflammation of the tongue, but it can be an inflammation taking the tongue, the esophagus, the stomach, meaning really affecting the way you can swallow and digest. So some patients lose weight. So this is something that we need to learn about how to treat it. Should we give PPI? Should we give some advice how to deal with the stomatitis? But that for me, the bottleneck. But still maybe a cheaper than docetaxel. What can always happen with uh, antibody drug conjugate is what you call inflammatory lung disease, interstitial lung disease. This uh, happens in a small proportion of patients, but patients have to be informed that if they cough, 
they have to come to you to tell you they have a new cough. It's maybe 3% of the patient population, okay? This is the progression-free survival curve. You can see it's nicely separated and, and remains separated. It's not a revolution, but it's still a benefit. And again, look at it. So non-screamers have a very important benefit, and there's no benefit at all in screamers. I would even say the other way around. In screamers, it looks like uh, that it actually is still a better a better option. And basically, interesting, in the patient with oncogene addiction, they're also called AGAs, actionable genomic alteration, so oncogene addiction. So how that ratio is also found. So you could also use it in lay lands, in EGFR mutant or ALK positive disease. Survival is still not uh, showing any difference. This is a survival in the whole patient population. There is a maturity of the survival curve of 50%. So maybe they will not change. But keep in mind one thing is maybe non-squeamers, it will become significant. Uh, again, in squeamers, certainly not. But maybe over time in non-squeamers, it will become significant with 0 0.77 at the time being. So let's stay tuned. I think this datopotamab deruxtecon is a treatment option but in non-screamers. Toxicity is seen here. I did the description before. So some chemo-like, but the stomatitis is the main problem. So for me, it significantly, but modestly improves progression-free survival, more benefit in non-screamers, moderately well-tolerated, but still better than docetaxel. And we are waiting for final analysis, right, for survival. So basically, Will we widely approve that and have access to that? This will be difficult at the HTA level. And Marie, we discussed it before. I think there will be lots of reluctancy by the regulators and by the payers due to the modest benefits. So I think we will have to face for this specific strategy, the real picture of disparity. And I fear this is going to be a real matter of debate. Last but not least, we haven't seen brain data. I would love to see them because un unexpectedly, these ADAs look like working in the brain. So we wait for long da brain data to be seen because this would give another argument in favor of this. What do you think, Anne-Marie? Yeah, well, I think, as you say, it is a very modest improvement. And, you know, I know what it's been compared against isn't exactly easy either. Um, so it, it is a very difficult balance. And, and I think, as you say, we really need to see a little bit more, whether it's the brain efficacy, um, you know, or or how it is more long term. But I think this again comes back to ensuring when people are in the clinic, really having that open discussion with the people who are impacted by this disease so that there's awareness of these are the reasons why we're making these sort of decisions and that people are then able to input into that so that they have shared decision making. Because I think, and this is a very broad speaking statement, I do understand that I'm making such a statement, but I think for a lot of people looking at that very, very modest survival benefit, and given that, you know, the side effects are still quite substantial, it is a very difficult decision to come to. So I think really it's more to see the, new, um, the data maturing and I think if there's brain efficacy, then I think that will definitely have an input then people's decisions as to whether or not they would favor this treatment over something else. So I think definitely more needed within this space. Another question that I was going to ask you, but you already covered it, is just a lot of people don't understand what ADCs are or how they work, and you explained that beautifully. So thank you so much. Um, I guess my only question really is, where would we go from here within this specific cohort of people with disease. Do you think it's um, continuing, but maybe altering the treatment dose slightly? What do you think is the next thing within this space in terms of ADCs? Yeah, there are two, two important developments in ADCs. First of all, we've seen it in bladder data in the ESMO meeting. There might be a way to combine ADCs because they create a lot of inf inflammation locally. So you, you might be aware of a benefit to combine ADCs with other treatment strategy, mainly immunotherapy. So in bladder cancer, it will completely change the paradigm of treatment of bladder cancer, for example. So first, trying to look at combinations and then trying to look at a scenario which is 
more prone to, to benefit more patients, which is the front line. So maybe combining with IO or with maybe platinum and IO front line. So all these ADCs will try to move up to the front line and move transversally with combinations. So this is absolutely needed to try to understand how they can enter the game a bit more. But I think what we are missing is two things. First of all, to understand if we can have better biomarkers, because what I didn't stress in this trial is the anchor of the ADC is TROP2. But if you try to measure TROP2, it's not predictive of the activity. So we have problems because we can't find a biomarker when it's obvious there should be one. You should you need the anchor to bind the ADC. So we have problems in defining biomarkers, maybe probably because it's dynamic. The protein is in and out of the cell in a, in a very dynamic way. So we need to develop uh, some predictive models that really the ones benefiting will benefit, like usually in oncology. So biomarkers is one, and then we need to understand why patients become resistant. Because with the other thing with ADC is maybe we can sequence one after the other one. So do they become resistant because the target disappears, the anchor, or because the chemo is not effective anymore? So all these kind of things are questions which are open. And I think ADC is just the beginning, like the first days of chemo in the past, and we will learn all these kind of things. Okay, that's great. Thanks so much, Solange. So now we're going to move on to the next abstract uh, that we're going to talk about in the next stage today. Yeah, so I will be able to maybe do quite fast on the two, two next abstract because they ask the same question and they question the same compound. So basically the idea is we go back to oncogene addiction, EGFR mutating non-small cell lung cancer, 20% of our patient population, 50% of the Asian population. So in that patient population, we give us imertinib frontline, established improving survival, improving other parameters going to the brain. So this pharma industry tries to do better than ozimertinib. So to do better than ozimertinib, they use the sister of ozimertinib because they produce the drug, lazertinib. Let's consider lazertinib is equivalent to ozimertinib. That's the same. They just uh, uh, comp they, they replace each other. And they add a drug on this, which is an interesting drug, amivantamab. As you can read in the name, it's a, a monoclonal antibody targeting on one hand MET and on the other hand, on the other moiety, EGFR. The idea of this antibody is to prevent a, a mechanism of oncogenic signaling, which allows sometimes cancer cells to escape from the drug you give, which is a MET signaling. MET can really very actively uh, provoke the uh, phenotype of lung cancer, phenotype of, of malignancy again, once you have to develop resistance for a treatment. So you have this bispecific antibody given with lazertinib versus ozimertinib. Is it better than ozimertinib? Okay. Uh, so that's the frontline strategy, trying to improve. So this is uh, about the description, amivantamab by specific antibody, lazotinib is the same as ozimertinib. And we had some data from phase one, phase two trials showing that it looks to work quite well, the combination of amivantamab and lazotinib. So in that trial, the main question is amivantamab lazotinib versus ozimertinib. So it's a thousand patients, right? For regulatory purpose, Lazotinib is a new drug, right? So there was one patient out of five who had to be randomized to lazotinib only just for the regulators to know that it works. So just for, we call it the contribution of components, okay? But that's not the aim of this trial. This trial is to compare amilazotinib versus ozimertinib, okay? Progression-free survival is the primary endpoint. These are the numbers. There is an improvement. So you improve to 24 months, the usual PFS of ozimertinib or 17 months, right? So response rate is unchanged, and the duration of response is also improved something like 10 months. So ballpark, you increase 9, 10 months, the PFS and duration of response. Okay? So that's something significant, right, that we really can consider uh, of being a change. Had that ratio 0.7, so you reduce the risk of relapse 30%. Uh, this is the curve, how they look like. So amivantamab lazotinib versus as a lazotinib or zimertinib, no need to say that they do the same. I told you they are twins. So that's what it looks like. Okay. Uh, this is uh, what we would like to see about a response rate. I told you it's almost the same. Uh, and you can also see here um, the 
next line treatments or so, so, and the duration of response. So all this data just proves that yamivantamab and lazotinib are a good treatment frontline, particularly on the right here, the median duration of response that looks like to be longer with uh, the dual therapy. The interim overall survival data, here the maturity is again something like 55%. So have a ratio of 0 0.8. So we are not far from significance, but it's still not significant and it might not become significant. Okay, so it looks good, you will tell me. But remember one thing. First of all, azimutinib was a nice drug because it was an oral drug. Uh, lazotinib is, uh, amivantamab is comp complex because you have to come many times for infusions, many times. And when you give an infusion, most of the patient present with an infusion reaction the first time, more than half of them. So a drug which is IV, constraining in terms of visits and toxic. And what is very toxic, it gives rise to all these all days GFR toxicities, right? The nails, the rash, the dry skin. So really some adverse events that are not seen with the ozimertinib. So a benefit in PFS, not in OS, and uh, a wide range of toxicity. Look at this uh, tornado plot. So you have this paronychia, which is really sometimes terrible, the rash, the diarrhea, the fatigue, the pruritus. So uh, you have to admit that it's not the same, okay? So there is, it is superior to ozimertinib, do we want to adopt it frontline? That is really a question, right? Uh, will OS make the difference? I'm not sure. And, and remember that sometimes people combine ozimotinib and chemotherapy based on another trial. We still have an option if some, if some patient needs to have more than ozimotinib and you are sure they need more. Would you give amivantamab or would you give some more chemo and the ozimotinib? This is really a, a, a strange frontline question that we have. Uh, and Marie, if you agree, I will go to the second abstract because it completes this picture, and then you you will add the question because the le next abstract is always amivantamab, always amivantamab. But the pharma was amazingly clever because what they did is they said, okay, let's imagine patients still receive ozimertinib frontline because you have understood that my preference. I prefer to continue with ozimertinib frontline. Can we recycle? Amivantamab in second line. So maybe it's not a frontline strategy, it's a second line strategy. So basically what they did in the trial, which was uh, quite interesting, is they take the patient after ozimertinib. And at the time of chemo, they compare chemo to amivantamab chemo, or like in the trial I showed before, amivantamab lazertinib chemo, okay? So the idea is, okay, let's try to recycle amivantamab for the second line setting. And this is what he calls the mariposa 2. The first one I presented was mariposa 1. This is mariposa 2. So very smart pharma trying to position it front line. And if not, let's position it in second line with chemo or with chemo plus the lazotinib. So the, the full package again, right? So basically, let's keep in mind that this one, the full package, was extremely toxic, right? So amivantamab, lazotinib, chemo, is not the way to go because it's extremely toxic. Hematological toxicity, all the rash, all the so, and it gives rise also to uh, lots of um, thrombosis, right? So, really, some things that I would not advise for, but I will show you the results, right? So, if you look at the amivantamab chemo uh, versus the amivantamab lazotinib chemo, and of course, the control arm is a chemo only. So 0 0.48, so in second line, added the amivantamab to chemo is really improving PFS. Adding the full package, so adding in addition lazotinib is almost the same, 0 0.44 as compared to 0 0.48. So really not so much different. I told you super toxic, right? But look at OS. OS looks like very promising, it's immature at the time being, very promising for amivantamab chemo. In the uh, four drugs, the whole package, it's not, because you have to stop the treatment, it's too toxic. So let's make something with you, let's block this, it's too toxic, and OS doesn't show any signal. But amivantamab is not so bad with chemo, right? So median PFS is 6.3, chemo 4.2, response rate 64%, chemo 36. The intracranial PFS, very surprisingly, 10.4, chemo 8.3. So I like this amivantamab chemo. Here you can see the curve, amivantamab chemo in blue, chemo in gray. This is interesting, right? So let's think about what I was telling before. You start with ozimertinib, you forget about combination frontline. Your patient has one or two years under ozimertinib, 
And when it's time for chemo, when it's time to come to the hospital every two, three weeks, when it's time for the IV drug, maybe amivantamab chemo is better than chemo. So here it makes sense for me. But keep in mind, uh, so this is the response rate. This is so uh, a nice improvement in response rate. This is the intracranial progression-free survival, all in favor of amivantamab chemo. And at the time being, this is the survival curve, and they look like to separate for the amivantamab chemo. But let's keep in mind one thing. If myself, I'm convinced about OZ, followed in second line by amivantamab chemo, so I'm convinced about mariposa 2 and not the mariposa 1, Let's keep in mind one thing. It still is a little bit toxic, right? Uh, when you give this amivantamab, you will have the problem of the rash, the problem of the diarrhea, the problem of the paronychia. You will still have some of these toxicities. So we need more follow-up, more real-world data, because this has toxicity. It will improve, it will increase the toxicity. Look at the, in general, the serious adverse event, I increased 10%. So the adverse event with a uh, discontinuation of the drug uh, is uh, slightly higher. So, of course, it's a bit more toxic. It goes discontinuation of any agents goes from four for chemo to 18 person with amine. So it's more toxic. But I find the benefit is worth trying and getting with its experience down the road. So that's what I think about the two Mariposa trial. Uh, so what do you think, Anne-Marie? I think it was nice fusing them because it was one strategy for the pharma industry. Yeah, so I mean, again, I would agree with what you said, you know, that it's it's always going to be the efficacy versus the quality of life, the side effect profile, the toxicity, because it's not about, you know, just adding time to someone's life. That addition of time must be good quality time, given the drugs that they're given. So, I mean, it it, it is definitely a difficult balance to do. Um. So, and I mean, again, as you say, even at a kind of a more basic level, given the infusion reactions that have been seen, like, are you then going to create more barriers to people accessing this treatment that could be a possibility for them? Because you may need to go to, as you say, more experienced centers, so there might be additional travel and all sorts of different things that might come into play when the decisions are made. Um but I know we don't have a huge amount of time, but I guess one of my questions around this is obviously this was by specific with EGFR and the MET. So how what is the percentage of MET as a resistance mechanism to EGFR? And should we be looking at other by specifics where there's other targets added on to it? Or maybe that's already in the pipeline um, for people who have EGFR positive lung cancer. Well, it's interesting you, you ask here for a very nice question. Basically, you ask what is the biomarker for amivantamab? Uh, and maybe it's the expression of MET or the uh, amplification of MET. So let me first answer this question. Unfortunately, amivantamab has been developed in that trial uh, irrespective of any biomarker. So it would make sense, right, that you'd like to see some level of expression of MET which might guide the benefit of abivantamab. And by the way, there were lots of explorations done in the phase two trial, for example, trying to see how much MET is needed to get the most out of it. And there was even signal that more MET was better. But in that trial, they used it in all patients because MET is most of the case, in most of the case, expressed. It can be low, it can be high, but it's almost always expressed. So this was developed unrelated to any biomarker. And when they presented the trial, they, of course, stay away at the time being from presenting any biomarker. I'm sure they are testing it. I'm not sure that if really a biomarker defines a small subset of patient benefiting, we will know about it because uh, the market is a market. But at the time being, amivantamab is given to all because almost all lung cancer tumors have a little amount of MET, a little amount. What is quite interesting is MET can be per se a pure mechanism of resistance to EGFR TKI. And it's not when it's expressed, it's when it is uh, amplified, meaning that you suddenly have the gene multiple copy uh, just in order to use this signaling to escape uh, from any kind of treatment. This is not the aim of this trial. It was not tested for amivantamab. And this proportion of MET amplified at EGFR resistant, EGFR TKI resistant, is probably depends on the population, but 20% of the patients. But they were not the target of this trial. I'm quite sure amivantamab will work there. Maybe they, it will work even better. 
but that's not what was the aim of the industry here. Amivantamab chemo uh, is given to unselected patients. So um, just to draw our session to a close, Solange, is there like one sentence that you could use to sum up what we've discussed today within the lung space um, for those that are watching us discuss these abstracts? Yeah, I guess we have some in the early disease, some absolute evidence of having creating revolution and changing the game. There are many other developments where qualifying a magnitude of benefit We'll need calculations through the MCBS score, for example, but we'll also need uh, reflection about long-term follow-up, about probably real-world data, meaning what is the real toxicity of an ADC when you are outside of a clinical trial? Is it more or less? I would guess it's probably a bit more. So all these kind of things we need to document because when the benefit is not so striking and when we have good treatments on board, Changing the paradigm of treatments needs to be extremely certain that at the end, it's a pure benefit for the patient. So all the ADCs will have this question. And when you think about the CGFR mutant, all of these trials lead probably the community to say the best frontline strategy is still ozimertinib, right? So 300, 400 million spent to go back to what we had in the past. Despite the PFS benefit from the combination, we think that maybe ozimertinib is good because it's oral, because it's not toxic and so on. So now to in oncology, benefit is not only an improvement in months. It's also everything around uh, and, and most importantly, what the patient can describe. So the magnitude of benefit needs really to be assessed carefully uh, before a standard is tendered. On the other way around, when it's absolutely obvious, think about the cell percatinib, when it's absolutely obvious and the treatment is beneficial, then we shouldn't struggle with that and make it available for patients. So I think the level of discussion we have with the regulators needs to be better classified and the discussions to be probably smarter uh, in the future to make sure that um, the decisions are, are, are correct and, and are making sense for the patients. Thank you so much, Solange. And I think definitely from an advocacy perspective, we need to ensure that trials and the trial topics and the prioritization are done in conjunction with those living with the disease, that they're ethical, that you're using all available um, data that's there, whether it's synthetic from the databases or whatever it might be, and understanding that these advancements still come at a cost in terms of the side effect profile and quality of life. However, we need to bring them through to the clinic so that people can have an input into that shared decision making of what's best and right for them in terms of their treatment goals. So with that, we'll draw this uh, to a close and huge thanks to Solange for all of the slides and the presentation. And thank you all for listening. Big thanks to you. <laughs> thanks for listening. Bye-bye.